Hey guys, so um, yeah, I made a video about Bible flock box recently, and in the video, the guy said, because we have a free will, we can choose to leave Jesus. And of course, if we leave Jesus, we can lose our salvation. You know, so I'm paraphrasing, he didn't say that, but he mentioned free will, and that was the basic premise for how you could not abide in the vine. Uh, anyone who abides not in me, the branches will wither uh, and men will carry them off into the fire to be burned. So you could see how many derivatives of a free will type teaching can give rise to loss of salvation through unbelief. You know, John mentions about 90 times, 95 times the word belief. Uh, in correlation with salvation. So you can see how one can link it to that. Now, I don't believe that. I don't believe that uh, you have a duty to continue to believe because it says in Romans 8, those he foreknew, he also predestinated. Those he predestinated, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified, right? So there's a, there's a chain of events that takes place there and you're predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son. So meaning one day we'll be like him on the day of his coming, like it says in First John and, and in Corinthians and in Philippians, you know. So, but this video is a response to, you know, people are, uh, be still and know uh, who used to call me a brother. You know, it's so funny how quickly these people will turn and rend you. Just, just, just talk about predestination. If it doesn't line up with their free will theology, forget it. You're, you're no longer their brother. And that's fine. Look, I understand that was going to happen. I'm not even like mad at these people. It's just, it's, it's, it's so utterly ridiculous that if you don't uh, subscribe to every single doctrine of their teaching, and I mean every single little bit of it, they're going to come at you. You don't believe in free will? You're a Calvinist devil. And Greg Jackson is probably one of the biggest supporters of this. You know, in one of his videos, I got, I, I'm just making a quick response for video uh, today, but I got to do a bigger video that's going to require a lot of scripture and work because th these people don't want to get into the scripture of it. They just want to make fun and, and uh, put up memes about Calvinism and stuff. You, you can't even, it's so funny, you can't even teach on predestination. It's, it's off limits. You, you're not allowed to do it because they'll disown you. Uh, and, and just like Jesus said, he said, don't give what is holy to the dogs lest they turn around and rend you. And that's exactly what happens. Uh, and, they'll, and they'll laugh at that saying, well, you know, what you're giving is not holy. God forbid we just go straight to the scriptures and look at them. I, I, you know, this is, this is not a rebuke of Calvinism. This is a comment from Greg Jackson less than a day ago. Calvinism teaches that God arbitrarily chooses who is preordained to be saved uh, and who is preordained to spend eternity frying in the lake of fire. So this guy, he pivots to emotion so quickly. There's, there's no reason to even get emotional about this stuff. The scriptures are so clear. The word choose comes up over and over again, and it's always God doing the choosing. It's never the people. It's never the people. And so since he can't back it up with scripture, he has to use adjectives and you know, it's just incredible how, how much of this is repetitive. I have seen him give teachings on this, and he must use the word arbitrary about 10,000 times. God does nothing arbitrary. God's choices and decisions are not arbitrary. What an insult to God. I mean, never would I turn and say that Greg is not saved for this. As utterly ridiculous and non-substantive his teachings are, uh, trying to rebuke Calvinism are, I would still never call him unsaved. He's just unlearned. He hasn't even dug into this. It, it, it's Some of the teachings are so devoid of scripture and actual substance. It's just him saying the word arbitrary, capricious, and whimsical over and over again. What he's doing is he's just creating a straw man so that the listener's like, yeah, that's that's arbitrary. That's whimsical. No, God's not like that. And and he's just, he's propping up this straw man and then he's feeding the straw man over and over again. And, and the whole time, it doesn't even exist. This this arbitrary God, this capricious God doesn't exist. Everything God does is by his own decree. I mean, do you, does anyone think that God doesn't have the right to choose? It, it, does it say anywhere in the scripture that God cannot choose? No, it says the polar opposite of that. Okay, did you choose to be born into the world? No, you did not choose to be born in the, in the world, yet here you are. 
Okay, so the same way you can't choose to be born again. And if any of you guys get like immediately maybe a, a, like a solemn feeling, oh no, am I one of the elect? Uh, did God choose me? You know, initially when I started to see scripture after scripture showing how it's God who does the choosing before the foundation of the world, yeah, it kind of hits you like, am I one of the elect? Uh-oh. You know, that's the main problem with Calvinism is, am I one of the elect? Well, what John Piper and MacArthur and Washer do is they'll judge you by your works in the flesh. They'll take a look at your life. I've heard Paul Washer say, if we were to put a video camera on you or something for 24-7, would we, would we see you keeping God's law? I don't teach that. The only... The only prerequisite is, do you believe the gospel? And you're one of his elect, it's that simple. And Arminians and Calvinists, I'm going to use those terms because I'm neither one of them. Greg's going to tell you he's not an Arminian, but he's going to lay out the Arminian doctrine on soteriology almost perfectly, that it's all by your choice. He doesn't believe in work salvation, uh, so then he'll, he'll adopt what Calvinists uh, preach about predestination after you believe the gospel. So it's kind of like a hybrid. He, he might say that I'm a hybrid Arminian, hybrid, uh, or no, he might just call me like a hyper-Calvinist or something. I don't know. I, I, look, all these names are silly. I believe the scripture. It just so happens that Calvinism brought about the doctrine of predestination and laid it out very, very clearly. And there's a lot of Calvinists that don't believe what Piper and Washer and all these heretics teach. I don't even think those guys believe the gospel. But back to what Greg is saying about it, uh, about how, you know, the, the arbitrarily choosing and all this, this is found nowhere in the scripture. No Calvinist is, is saying that God arbitrarily does anything. But let's get to the comment here because I just wanted to make a response to it. Uh, so then it says, this is completely unbiblical for all the reasons I share in this video. Why unconditional election is one of the five tenets of Calvinism is unbiblical. That's the video. This video is completely devoid of any substance whatsoever on debunking unconditional election. He never brought up Romans 9, 11 through 16, where it comes from. He wouldn't even touch on that. I mean, God said, for Jacob I have loved and Esau I have hated, uh, so that the twins not having been born yet, not having done any good or bad, so that the purpose of God's election might stand. I mean, you, you can't get any clearer than that. And, and then Paul puts a hard rebuke out after that. Will you find unrighteousness, unrighteousness with God? Nay, God forbid. So he's telling the reader, you know, don't find, you can't find unrighteousness with God because he makes a sovereign choice. That's exactly what these people are doing. They're going to tell you, oh, it's about nations, but it says later in Romans 9, uh, can the potter say to the clay, or I'm sorry, can the clay say to the potter, why hast thou made me thus? So can you reply back to God? No, you can't reply back to God and complain about why he made you the way he made you. Uh, and people don't want to deal with these scriptures because it gives way to, in their eyes, a God that is uh, satanic, an antichrist God. God can't be this way. He's love. He loves everybody for God so loved the world. Look, if, if God loved the world with a salvific love, then every man would be saved. Because Jesus said in John 17, I pray not for the world, uh, and he also makes a comparison on, um, I, I pray for you, but I pray not for the world. He's talking about his sheep. In that specific verse, he's talking about the disciples, but then he goes on to say, I have another sheep, and they are not, you know, not these sheep, but they are mine too. And so clearly we want to believe that Jesus didn't come for only the lost sheep of the house of Israel, but he has another sheep, which is when the Gentiles will be brought in. That's why Jesus said in John 12, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. That's not every man born since Adam. Okay, that simply means now the Gentiles will come in from all the Gentile nations around the world. First, the gospel went out in Jerusalem, right? Uh, okay, so he came for the lost house of the sheep of Israel, uh, lost house of Israel, lost sheep of the house of Israel, and then the gospel went out to the Gentiles after Jesus went up, after he was lifted up. So that's what he's talking about. All right, so I'll, I'll get into all that stuff in the next video, but this is really what I wanted to uh, respond to. I'm getting it's it's hard to stay on track with this because it's this so much information to cover it's for me it's it's difficult to stay on track so i apologize but he, here here's the rest of the the uh, comment god is sovereign and knows ahead of time since he is outside of time who will believe the gospel and get saved and who won't this is this is ridiculous what what, what he's saying by implication without even realizing it is that god created reality 
knowing every single person while he was creating them, which one would believe and which wouldn't. Yet he's going to try to tell you that God had to wait to see that person, what they would do in his reality, in his own reality that he created. God had to wait and see what you were going to do. So you, Mr. Johnny Appleseed, I can see that you're going to believe the gospel. So now I choose you, right? Uh, uh, you, Mrs. A, you know, you, I can see that you clearly didn't believe the gospel. So I don't choose you. That's not what the scripture says. And just to take a quick look at it, because, you know, this is, this is what you got to do. You got to go to the scripture. There's really no other way. First of all, take a look at Matthew 11, um, or Matthew 13, sorry, 10 and 11. And the disciples came and said to him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? Who? People that don't believe. He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Okay? And let me show you verses in John. Uh, so, let's see. That, that the saying of Isaiah the prophet, starting, I'm sorry, verse, uh, verse 38 from John 12, that the saying of Isaiah, this is Isaiah, the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report? And to, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Okay, so don't just read that and be like, okay, the arm of the Lord been revealed. So, because Jesus makes another, uh, before we even continue reading that, let me show you something that's even more clear in Matthew 11. And this comes right before some of our favorite words that Jesus ever spoke. And I don't know how many times we've read these scriptures that precede it. All things, this is Matthew eleven twenty seven. all things are delivered unto me of my Father. So this is all things. This is not, you know, an ambiguous statement. It's all things. Uh, all things are delivered unto me of my Father. And no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son and whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Okay, so there are antecedent causes to why people believe. Okay, in John 6, Jesus says something beautiful. He says, all that the Father hath given to me will come to me, and I will nowise cast him out. Okay, this is a permanent position with God. Guys, this is your eternal security. So we can't turn this verse upside down. First, you're given, then you come. Jesus says in John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger, and he who believeth on me will never thirst. So coming to Jesus is believing in him. We, we all want to believe that because that's our eternal security. Because after that, you're going you're gonna to see the fact that n no one is cast out who comes to Jesus, right? But what is the antecedent cause to you coming to him? All that the Father has giveth to me. And then you see here in Matthew eleven twenty seven, all things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Uh, back to John twelve. Uh, so this is John twelve thirty eight, that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report. And to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Remember, and to whom the Son will reveal him. And to whom whomsoever the Son chooses to reveal him, from Matthew 27, uh, Matthew eleven twenty seven. Therefore they could not believe, because Isaiah said again, He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. Guys, this antecedent cause is going on here, and that's all I've come to the realization of. I'm not looking to come out and, you know, I'm not the one making a video or commenting saying anyone that believes in free will believes in another Jesus. Because in one of Greg Jackson's video, he says, if you think that God arbitrarily chooses, uh, capriciously, whimsically chooses, then you believe in another Jesus. What he's really saying is you're not saved. So he's just doing the same thing that, the, that he's... <laughs> that he's coming out against the Calvinists for because they judge people by their works, right? So he's saying, you know, these people are heretics and, you know, he'll always say if they believe the gospel, they'll say, but then he'll allude to this, well, you know, but there's a good chance they're not. And I understand why he's doing that. But now he's extending that to anyone who simply believes in predestination. You know, so he now he's saying, well, you, you know, if, if you, if this is all you've ever believed, then you believe in another Jesus. 
So he's essentially telling you that you're not saved. So yes, according to Greg Jackson, there are conditions to salvation. You can't believe in a certain doctrine and be saved. This offer doesn't go out to everyone like he's trying to say. So he's actually a victim of his own logical fallacy because what he's saying is that the offer is not to everyone. It's only to everyone who believes in free will. I don't even know if he realizes what kind of a, you know, ridiculous statement that is to say that, you know, for God so loved the world means every man since Adam, not backing that up with scripture and then also defending that yourself and saying, well, it's not every man since Adam. It's the men that believe in free will. You know, they'll, they'll get that offer. That's really all he's saying. He's just contradicting himself. Um, so let's see if we get through the rest of the comment. Uh, God is sovereign and knows ahead of time since he's outside of time who will believe the gospel and get saved, right? So he's saying God set this reality into motion and then he's waiting and watching to see who would believe and who wouldn't. And then he's reacting according to that. That would mean that God is learning things about you that he doesn't know already. Or even if it all happens in a nanosecond, like he's trying to say God knows, but still, God would still have to, no matter how quickly he sees down the corridors of time and how quickly he's able to ascertain this information and understand he's still waiting for you to make the first move, which is ridiculous, that, that you're saying God's not the first mover. Uh, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God giveth the increase, right? So when you hear the gospel, who gives the increase? Philippians 1 6 says, I am I'm confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will perform it until the day of judgment. Do we want to believe that God began a good work in us? Well, what is the work of God? John 6 29. This is the work of God that we believe on the one whom he sent. So who began that good work in you? Did you begin it? No, clearly not. And so God gives you the increase. When you hear the gospel, God's going to give you the increase. Is he going to give the increase to every single set of ears that hears the gospel? No, that's why Jesus would say, he who has an ear, let him hear. What is Jesus really saying? Everyone has ears. He's saying, he who has understanding, let him hear. Well, not everybody has understanding. That has to be given to you. That's clear. Uh, so, and then here we go with some more, just, this is just, this is not, none of this is in the Bible. Uh, but foreknowledge, uh, the gospel, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> He's outside of time. Uh, he could see who will believe the gospel and get saved and who won't. Yet, and, and but Greg's just, he's not even alluding to the fact that God's creating sheep and goats this whole time. Like he's making this reality. He's creating sheep and goats. His will is that no man perish, yet the vast majority of his creation are goats. He sees that through the foreknowledge. So even from Greg's point of view, God's still setting that reality into motion and all these people will get destroyed. So he's just creating a, a reality that's completely antithetical to his own will. That, that's that's ridiculous because he said, I will bring all my pleasure to pass in a multitude of verses. Multitude of verses, God will have his way. Uh, that's clear. Uh, but foreknowledge doesn't negate free will. Uh, just another assertion that he's making. Uh, I mean, yeah, foreknowledge technically wouldn't negate free will. That's fine. Uh, nothing wrong with that. Uh, but still, it also doesn't insinuate that there is a free will. God has given man free will. That's an assertion. We are not robots. Well, Romans 9 calls them vessels of wrath and vessels of honor. Uh, so vessel would be a better word. Sure, we're not an actual robot. Uh, but, you know, we never loved God. We were walking around dead in our sin. No one seeketh after God. No one seeketh after wisdom. And, and something happened when we got hit with the gospel. And God give, gives understanding to people and they're able to believe the gospel. That's why many people will hear the gospel and not believe it because they won't have that understanding. Uh, we're not robots and it doesn't intention and, and doesn't intentionally create some to believe and get saved and others get saved and preordain others to not believe and spend eternity in the fiery furnace tormented forever. Okay. So he does believe that though. Cause like I just said, God knew even by this logic, God knows who will get saved and who won't yet. He puts that reality into motion. And now here's his reality, I guess, just flailing out of control before his very eyes. And all these people are going to go to the fiery furnace and be tormented forever. Okay, so he's saying he didn't preordain it, but yet he knew it would happen to them, right? Because he has the foreknowledge. I'm not even saying that he made certain people believe and made other people not believe to not believe. I don't think God doesn't make anyone believe uh Anything, he gives them an understanding. And if you want to say that he forces that on them, 
that's fine. You know, did, did God force you to be born? Did, did you ask to come into this world? No, and yet here you are. Uh, and same way with your being born again, God can switch the disposition of your will and desire. He can soften your heart to belief. He's not going to do that for everyone. That's clear. Okay, he, he can throw everybody into the lake of fire right now and be just in doing it. Okay, just like he destroyed the world in a flood. Okay, but no, he didn't do that. Okay, he set this plan in motion knowing that most would be destroyed. So Greg has to also submit to the fact that God will intentionally send a bunch of people to hell. Uh, and what really you, you can say is the argument's going to be, well, no, they didn't believe. Well, what was so good about you that you believed? God gave you an understanding, right? There's nothing good in you. Paul said there's nothing good in my flesh. So people don't submit to the fact that there's nothing good in them. Uh, they, they'll do that when it's talking about works and how we can't produce any good works in the flesh. It has to be of the Spirit. But when it comes to believing in God, we have something good in us that allows us to believe and the next person who's not going to get saved, they just don't have that understanding. They don't have that goodness in them. They're not realizing that they're still supporting total depravity in that sense. They're just saying that it was them who did it. So they're just taking the credit. I'm not taking the credit for that good work that God performed in me, giving me the understanding to even believe spiritual things because the natural man doesn't receive it, the things of the spirit, okay? Because he cannot understand them because he's spiritually discerned. Uh, and then here we go with some more adjectives. Such, uh, such a God would be capricious, whimsical, arbitrary, and downright evil. And we know that is not the God of the Bible who desires that none would perish, but that all would come to the faith, right? So, well, that's not gonna happen though. <laughs> Yet God let that reality play out, okay? And he didn't do anything about it. So what you're saying is that God's plan got destroyed by man's will. That's really what you're saying. These adjectives, capricious, whimsical, arbitrary, th this is downright evil. No, you're just finding unrighteousness in God. You're just literally calling him incapable of bringing his will to pass. Let me show you a verse in Isaiah. This is Isaiah uh, 46, 10. Uh, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. So Greg says it's it's God's will, and I would, I would assume we can lend that to his pleasure, that every man since Adam be saved, and he's going to use this verse to defend that. Uh, probably one of the most out-of-context verses in the Bible uh, when coming to this debate, if you will. So we got 2 Peter 3, 9. All right, so 2 Peter 3, 9. Let's give it a little bit of context. But beloved, so Peter's addressing beloved, which we all agree are believers. Be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. And a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness, but as long-suffering to who? It's to us word, not willing that any should perish. That's all it says, but that all should come to repentance. This is not saying all men since Adam. There's nothing even remotely close to that in this verse. He literally says to us word, and when you look at the antecedent verse, you can see who the us word is. You know, you might as well just say us to make it a little more, you know, the King James is a little different way of wording things than we would. But what it's simply saying is, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. And then it says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. Well, what's what are the promises and callings of God, right? Uh, the gifts and callings of God are irrevocable, Romans eleven twenty nine. Well, who, who are called? Not everyone is called, okay? I'll get to that in one second. But it says here, uh, but is long suff suffering to us, the beloved, long suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, any of us, okay? And this this is clearly written for us in, in John 6, where the, the verses give you the order of things that you're given by the Father. Those that are given will come to him, and he will no wise cast them out. And this is the will of my Father, that all that my Father has given to me, I shall lose nothing. So what, what Greg is saying is God's going to lose a lot, right? I mean, he wants all these people to get saved, but he just can't do anything about it. So really, he, all that the Father has given to him he, he should lose nothing. Nothing. Well, if it's his will that all these men don't perish, then why is it 
that he can't apply that verse where it says, all that my father has given to me, this is the will of my father, that all he has given to me, that I should lose nothing and raise it up at the last day. All that my father has given to me shall come to me and I will no wise cast him out. And I will also raise him up at the last day, it said in John 6, 40. So the will is that Jesus loses nothing. You'd have to believe that he loses a ton if you sign on for this, that it was his will that every single man since Adam believe. I mean, do you know how many people haven't heard the gospel? You know, these, these people don't even think about where they're at. They're in the USA, these people. Be still and know, Greg Jackson, Nicholas Getty. They've been exposed heavily to the gospel. And think about how many false gospels there are in the US. We still have to contend with that. Many people can fall victim to believing a false gospel. Now, do you live in North Korea? You know, where there's like a picture of uh, Mao Zedong or no, uh, Kim Jong-un in your living room? You know, like, do you think these people are getting the gospel? Do they have the same fair and equal opportunity that you do? So obviously there's gonna be people that go their whole life and perish without hearing the true gospel of grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't sit there and tell me with a straight face that everyone's going to be ministered to and have the equal opportunity you did to hear and learn about the gospel. Okay, people in Muslim countries who were raised from birth, reading the Quran from age five. Uh, I've seen videos of them whipping them with a mini stick like when they couldn't memorize the verses. Those people could easily die never hearing the gospel once. All they know is Jesus was called Isa in the Quran. That's all they know about him. Okay, so if you could sit there and tell me with a straight face that they have the same opportunity you did to hear and understand the gospel, I mean, that's mind-blowing to me that you can think that. Uh, but yeah, so this, this comment, it, it uses a lot of just his own reasoning, no scripture, the video, you, you know, I'll do a video on this video here, why unconditional election is not biblical. Uh, most of the video is, I think the first seven, eight minutes is him saying, God is not arbitrary. He's not capricious and things like that. Just asserting who God is without using any scripture to back it up. God will bring all of his will and pleasure to pass. Make no mistake about that. God is sovereign. Okay. He's sovereign overall. Greg likes to say God's a hundred percent sovereign, but man's got free will. Doesn't say that anywhere in the Bible. Doesn't say that we chose God anywhere in the Bible. He uses a verse uh, when Joshua speaks to the children of Israel and says, choose you this day, life or death. And then he wants to use Old Testament verses where God says, you know, uh, you know, if you keep my commandments, you shall live. So what do we, are we work salvationists now? Do we believe that men were justified by faith plus works? Uh, because he uses um, Ezekiel, I think it's uh, Ezekiel 33, 11. Let me check it out real quick and then I'm going to end the video because it's already, this stuff gets very, very heavy with uh, doctrine and scripture. Very, very heavy, very quickly too. Um, ah, hit this one. So, uh, he's 3311 and he says, look, God doesn't want anybody to go to hell. And he uses Ezekiel 3311. Say, uh, let me give some context. Um, Ezekiel, uh, 33, 8. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die if thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way. The wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity. So are we repenting your sins, preachers, now because of these verses? But thou hast delivered thy soul. Therefore, O thou son of man, speak unto the house of Israel. Thus ye speak, saying, If our transgressions and our sins be upon us, and we pine away in them, how should we then live? Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye uh, from your evil ways for for why will ye die, O house of Israel? Okay, so he wants to use this verse to talk about how God doesn't take pleasure in people going to hell. Well, according to this verse, if you're looking at this death as an everlasting punishment death, look what it says to do to, do to avoid that, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. 
So that's eternal life? So you have to repent of your sins to have eternal life now, Greg? Is that what you're saying? I mean, do you believe that everyone was saved by faith alone from Genesis to Revelation? So, yeah, no one's saying God takes pleasure in the physical death of a man. That's not being spoken anywhere in these doctrines. Uh, all, all we're showing is how clearly the scripture says over and over again that God shows. And according to Greg Jackson, he's simply not allowed to do that lest he be um, an evil God who's arbitrary, capricious, and whimsical. Take a look at 1 Corinthians 26. Paul's talking to believers here. He's not talking, this is not a general message going out to the world. For see, uh, for ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise uh, men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. So, so what is Paul saying here? Is he saying everyone is called? No. He's saying that not many wise men, okay, of the flesh or after the flesh, not many mightal, uh, mighty, not many noble are called. So out of those types of people, there's not many called. But God hath chosen the, chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. So there's a purpose in why he does things. He wants to confound the mighty. And base things of the world, and things which are despised, hath chosen Yea, and things which are not to bring naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. So these people who believe in free will and will, forget it, they'll cast you out as a dog if you don't believe in free will. Um... They don't, they don't want to, you know, they love these gifts here, righteousness, sanctification. Yeah, that's that's given unto us, sure. I believe that wholeheartedly. But look at this. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus. He who began a good work in you will perform to the day of judgment. God gives the increase, okay? So clearly God is making a choice here. Is God arbitrary? No, because here he's giving, you know, he's giving a cause. He wants to confound the weak things. But... The bottom line is there are ones that aren't chosen. That couldn't be any more clear according to these verses. This is not a general message that is saying every single man since Adam is called. Uh, and we can see that because there's many, many people that have never heard the gospel before. So how can they have been called? Uh, another difficult verse that you know, they're going to make uh, many apologetic sidestepping moves on is Second Thessalonians 2.13, pretty much a standalone verse. Um, actually, we'll start in 11. And for this cause, God shall send them a strong... <clears throat> Let me start in 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth. You see, they'll say, see, they decided not to receive it. It doesn't say they decided that. Okay, when someone doesn't believe, a lot of times there's not an antecedent cause to that, and it seems like no one really wants to go there. But it says because they received not the love of the truth and that they might be saved. It just simply says they didn't receive the love of the truth. And for this cause, God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Okay, remember what it said in John 12. Uh, he will harden their hearts. Okay, talking about the Pharisees, I believe. Um, why, the disciple said, why do, you, why do you speak in parables? And he, he says, he does it on purpose so they wouldn't understand. I mean, that's pretty heavy. You have to deal with that. Uh, and then it says that they might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So you might say, see, well, this is why they're damned. They had pleasure in unrighteousness. Well, the fact that they have pleasure in unrighteousness is because they simply are... Uh, starting out unrighteous, the same way in Romans 3, it says, There is no one righteous, no, not one, none seeketh after wisdom, none seeketh after God. So we're all walking around dead in our sin. And then when the Holy Spirit calls you, when the Father draws you, because the Father has to draw us, we all submit to that. Well, if the Father is drawing you, then you're, you're getting saved. It's as simple as that. The Father's not going to draw you and miss. 
the, the, the Greek word for that is haluko, and it actually means drag. It's the same word that was used in Acts when Paul was hauled off to prison. Haluko, dragged. So the drawing of God is not a drawing that you can resist. Uh, that's, that's utterly ridiculous that you would think God's going to draw you and then you're, you're going to be able to resist his will. It even says in Romans 9, for who hath resisted his will? Um, so the ones that continue to take pleasure in unrighteousness are just where they were from the beginning. We all took pleasure in unrighteousness until God gave us the increase, right? So these people are just where they were at the beginning. And then verse 13, it says, but we are bound to give thanks always. Now he's talking about believers again. Uh, but we are bound to give thanks always to God for you. Brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. Okay, it doesn't say that God chose you after you chose him. Every time they see these verses, they just import that one little mechanism. Well, God knew that you would choose him, so he chose you back. No, it doesn't say that. It simply says he chose you. It would simply cease being a choice of God if you first chose him. I mean, that's, that's totally nonsensical and illogical. It, why wouldn't the scripture just say we chose God? Remember, 1 John says this, because if you believe that God loves every single person in the world, then they should all be saved. Um, uh, 1 John says this, right? Because Greg had given a reason why free will has to be a thing, and his reasoning was this. Uh, how would God know if our love for him is real? So that's how we get saved now, by loving God? He doesn't, he doesn't even teach that. It's just, it's just another weird way to try to show that you have a free will. Uh, 1 John 4.10 says, Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And now there's another verse in here that says the propitiation uh, for the sins of the whole, not just our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. So people deduce that, well, this is every single man since Adam. And well, well you know, John, John spoke to the circumcision. Uh, John wrote to the circumcision. Now, I believe that any saved believer can read 1 John. It's, I'm not saying that 1 John was only written to Jews, but it's written about them at that time. And so when he says, and he didn't die for our sins only, but the sins of the whole world, the hour there is the Jews, okay? Because the Gentiles are now coming in. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Uh, Revelation 5, I think it talks about how they were holding palm leaves in their hands and dressed in white raiment, and they were from all tribes, tongues, nations. So that's the all, is that it's men from everywhere, from all over the world. It's, it can't be every man since Adam. If God loved every man born since Adam with a salvific love, then they would all be saved. It's, it's that simple. What you're saying is God loves them, but he's going to send them to the fiery furnace forever, just like Greg wrote in his, uh, his comment there. He loves them, but he's going to watch them burn in hell for all eternity. So I can flip that right back at him. Uh, and in John 17, we're going to see something. Uh, so John 17, 20 says, uh, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe. So there he's talking about the disciples. And then he's talking about for those that believe. Okay? Uh, and then in verse 21 it says, That they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. Okay? And then, uh, let's see. Let me see here. It was John 17, 9. Um, or let's start in 8. For I have given unto them the words which thou hast gavest me, and they have received them. Okay, do you see the order there? For I have given unto them, this is a specific people. This, this is Jesus' sheep. Okay? And they have received them, 
and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. Okay, the love that Jesus has for the Father and the Father, Father's love for the Son is the same love that he has for his sheep. If, if you're saying that he has that same love for every man born since Adam, then why are they going to hell? Why are any of them going to hell? Okay, let's, let's take a look at John 15. Okay, because we want to read... John 14 through 17 is, is really Jesus speaking to the disciples. John 17 is the prayer he makes for them and for his sheep. Um, he says here, very, very plainly, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he, he may give it to you. Okay, and these things I command to you that you love one another. Okay, this is a preferential love for the brethren. Uh, if the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. Uh, and then if we take a look at John 10, as far as Jesus dying for every single man born since Adam, well, then you're going to have to define this verse here and try to make this work somehow. Um, Jesus said, John 10, 15, as the, as the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay uh, down my life for the sheep. And here's where Jesus talks about the body of Christ. This is amazing stuff. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them I also uh, I must bring, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice. Uh, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Okay, so remember Jesus always says in Revelation, he who has an ear, let him hear. Okay, it's, it's not just a physical ear, it's an understanding. So he who has an understanding. So you'd have to say that I, you know, God didn't give me this understanding. I gave it to me. I just, I heard the gospel and, you know, I assented to this belief and there's just something different about me than these people who don't believe. You know, I just, I have this capability to understand. So you're glorying in your capability to believe. That's, you know, um, that's what you're doing. You may not think of it as something to glory in, but it sure would be because it's the difference between you being saved and not. Uh, you're not giving it all to God at that point. Uh, you're just saying there's something inherently good about me. Meanwhile, God made every person the way they are. So no matter how you circle this thing back, it always points to God. Um, Greg will say in some of his videos, these people, meaning Calvinist devils, these people, you know, they say salvation is 100% of God. Wow. God forbid, right? God forbid that salvation is 100% of God, right? Isn't that incredible? God, God forbid it's not worthy in the Lamb is me. I have to be the one who believed. Because I have a free will, and I have to hold on to that like grim death. And I have to castigate anyone else who doesn't believe it. That's really all he's saying. You know, uh, Paul said, uh, fathers or, or husbands love your wives uh, as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Okay, he gave himself up for the church. You know, it doesn't say here uh, in John uh, ten fifteen that, you know, he laid down his life for the sheep and the goats. He laid down his life for the sheep. You know, he, 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 God foreknew you. So, you know, the foreknowledge that God has, like in Romans chapter 8, that's a foreknowledge that is way more intimate than him just knowing the events that are going to take place in your life. That foreknowledge is God knowing you, knowing you intimately. Uh, that's Romans 8. You know, and this is where this doctrine comes from. It's not just a bunch of made-up garbage that people like to call it without even giving it a proper look. For whom he did foreknow, Romans 8, 29, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. For whom, for whom he did foreknow. Remember Jesus said, Matthew 7, depart from me, I never knew you. This foreknowledge is total salvation. It's utterly everything about you and why you're here today believing the gospel okay and so this this went on way long this is not easy to talk about this is not an easy thing to get through in some kind of succinct manner um i'm just trying to do the best i can by reacting to what i think is just an incredible showing of 
just disdain for anyone who wants to teach on predestination. This is a taboo topic for these people. You got to submit to their free will doctrine or get the heck out of their fold. That's really all they're saying. Now they're going to post memes about Calvinism all day. Uh, well, I guess I'm a Calvinist. You know, I don't even, I never looked at it that way. I just took a good hard look at this doctrine of predestination and God forbid I believe in it. God forbid I believe that God is totally sovereign and that he will do according to his will and the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. Daniel 435. He does according to his will. I don't look at your works to see if you're saved. You guys have heard my preaching for months. I am once saved, always saved, and that couldn't be any more backed by predestination. Uh, that, that's, that's the biggest proponent of the fact that we're once saved, always saved, is that we are predestined. You know, God foreordained us before the foundation of the world. And the scripture says that. The scripture says that, but if I say it, I'm a Calvinist. So all I have to do is merely repeat certain scriptures and you just get labeled a Calvinist. And I just think yeah, I have to, I have to respond. I can't just sit there and, and, and let people, you know, say things about this doctrine that are completely false and then not even go into the passages where the doctrine's created and exegete them properly. They just use ad adjectives to describe, you know, that, that God created a world where just every one of us does as we wilt. Is it, didn't Aleister Crowley, the famous Satanist, say that? Do as thou wilt, and he had one hand pointing up, like the Baphomet, and one hand pointing down. Do as thou wilt. That's the free will, you know, uh, mantra. You guys, you, you have a free will, you can do as thou wilt. No, I say we don't have a free will in the sense that, yeah, sure, we make choices, but there's an ultimate will that will be brought to pass, and that's God's will. So I, I hope this edifies someone, and I, I really hope this doesn't have to continue to be adversarial. I never meant for it to be that way in the first place. God bless you guys. Take care.